All right. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to day or sorry, webinar number two in our series uh, for 2023 Plant Health Care webinar series through Rainbow Ecoscience. And welcome again. Uh, my name is Corey McCurry, your moderator today. And before we begin, I would like to start off with a quick safety brief. Um, we do this because it's one of our core values at Rainbow Ecoscience is safety. We always want to make a, a complete, a quick safety brief to remind ourselves of our safety protocols. Please check your surroundings for any trip hazards such as cords or bags. We have attendees from all over the country, perhaps the world. So just be aware of any inclement weather in your area. I noticed um, in the news yesterday was a big snowstorm for many or some of you here in the United States. So just be cautious. If you're in a vehicle, just make sure you're pulled over and parked in a safe location and enjoy thoroughly. My name again is Corey McCurry. I'm an arborologist here serving the Midwest United States, living locally in Chicago. My background is an ISA certified arborist with my bachelor's degree in biology from Fort Hayes State University and a minor in chemistry. If you have questions during the webinar, please type that into the Q&A box using your control panel. We'll answer them at the end. We are recording this webinar and it will be available afterwards. You'll receive an email with the link to view it. Finally, this webinar is worth one ISA CEU. If you did not enter or don't remember if you entered your ISA certification number in during registration, you can type that into the Q&A box right now and we'll make sure you get your CEU. Without further ado, I wanna introduce our speaker for today, Mark Ware. He'll tell you a little bit about what an arborologist is and does and about himself and how he serves a greater purpose at our company, Rainbow Ecoscience. So Mark, take it away. Yeah, thanks, Corey. Uh, thanks everybody for jumping on here. Um, as Corey so wonderfully introduced, my name is Mark Ware. I am an arborologist with Rainbow Ecoscience. I serve the Northeast. I'm based here just south of Philadelphia. Um, and uh, yeah, so for those of you who are unfamiliar with the term arborologist, um, it is kind of, uh, it's not something you hear every day. Um, what, what we, what arborologists, what we do is, is an internal term that we use. Uh, and essentially what our responsibilities are is uh, field training and education on plant health care protocols. We do a lot of technical support and field support with our clients. Um, we do a lot of plant health care education, hence these seminars. We go to a lot of trade shows and do um, presentations there as well. And uh, we also do a little bit of the uh, internal R&D and working with our cooperators. We always have fun doing that. Uh, it's a big part of Rainbow and who we are and what we do. Um, a little bit about myself really briefly before we jump into it. I'm a board certified master arborist. I've been in the industry for about uh, gosh, I don't know, 12 years or so now. Um, most of that time being in plant health care, being out in the field, uh, actually doing these applications. So uh, it's fun to take all of that knowledge now and be able to um, portray it on to other folks and use that to help other folks and in, in, uh, in what they are doing out in the field. So today we are going to be talking about spotted lanternfly. Um, they're for a lot of us, especially here in the Northeast. Uh, you might be sick and tired of hearing about it. Uh, but for those folks where it may be new, it may not be there yet, or you're just hoping to learn something, uh, we are going to learn something today, hopefully. Uh, we're going to go through basically the uh, why it is an issue, what the threat is. We're going to go through the biology of it, uh, because without the biology, it's hard to understand some of the treatment options we're going to talk about. Um, and then finally, we're going to be able to uh, recommend the management options that we have, uh, and we're going to talk about pest tolerances and all of that fun stuff as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. So a few of the key distinctions, distinctions before we jump in here uh, is that spotted lanternfly feeding, while it has led to grapevine mortality, um, it appears to be certainly much more of a nuisance or a plant stressor in our landscapes for our ornamentals, right? Um, if you own a vineyard, it's a little bit more of an issue and we're probably gonna do more to deal with it. But in the most uh, in, in most cases, uh, when we're talking about ornamental landscapes, we are going to, it's gonna be referred to as a stressor or a nuisance pest. Uh, 
we have a lot of other nuisance pets in our landscapes as well. So it's in good company, right? Spotted lanternfly has very different life stages, and we're going to talk about why that's important and what they are. Uh, because during these different life stages, they're going to be feeding on different plants and different plant parts. Uh, spotted lanternfly also will feed on numerous plant species, but once again, different hosts at different times in its life cycle. Uh, it's also spreading very rapidly, and it is very easy to move this pest accidentally. So we're going to talk about that. Um, quarantines are in place in most areas that infestations are present. Um, and it's important that if we are in a quarantine zone, that we are following those, those measures, right? Uh, making sure that, and we're going to talk about this as we get into it, but making sure that we're uh, following those recommendations and measures is very important. Uh, we're going to talk about Transtect and Transtect Infusible, which are our two Dynatefuron products and are great options when it comes to managing this pest um, chemically. Uh, we also have bifenthrin, which is, a, is, is, is an option. We're going to talk a little bit about that. And we're also going to talk about basing our treatments on the tolerance that our clients have, right? Uh, landscape treatment plans should always be based on our client uh, pest tolerance. <clears throat> so what is a spotted lanternfly? Uh, well, guess what? It's not a fly and it's not a moth, even though it kind of looks like one. It is a plant hopper and it comes out of Vietnam. Uh, and China, and uh, it's in our Hemiptera family, which we have a lot of other good friends in that Hemiptera family. Uh, it's a true bug family, so our friends the cicadas and aphids and adelgids, uh, a lot of our scales and white flies, they're all in that family. So this thing is in very good company, and we're familiar with a lot of its uh, family members. Uh, we deal with them quite a bit out there right now, um, and uh, so. As being part of that family, it does have a piercing sucking mouth part. Now, if you look really closely, you can actually see it in this picture. It looks like it's a leg, um, but upon closer look, you'll see that this is actually its mouth part. So there's a great uh, shot there of uh, that piercing sucking mouth part that I'm talking about. Um, it came to the United States back in September of 2014. Um, uh, it actually it came prior to that, but that was when it was first detected. Uh, it was detected in Boyertown, Pennsylvania, in a stone yard, which to me is just hilarious because Pennsylvania has enough stone in the ground already. Uh, if you ever tried to dig in Pennsylvania, uh, you get like an inch and a half down and you just hit boulders right away. So um, <laughs> um, I think this was actually uh, clay pots that it came in on, um, which is a little bit different. But um, regardless, uh, this is how it showed up. Uh, this is how it was believed to be imported. And the key thing here is, is you know, this stone yard by itself has over 150 shipments annually. Uh, and this is just one stone yard. And this is just one place where we get imports from, right? So these invasive pests, we've been dealing with them forever and we're going to continue to deal with them. Uh, and so uh, this is just so happens to be the one we're talking about today. But really, there's a, a whole multitude of, of different invasive pests that we could be talking about. And maybe talking about in the future, right? So um, as of December 1st, this is, a, this is a great map put out by the New York State's uh, IPM program. Uh, and this shows you the most recent um, infestation areas. You can see the areas shaded in blue are where we have, those are the counties that have current infestations, right? And now if you see a red outline around those counties, what that is indicating is that that is a quarantine area. So there is a quarantine in place in those counties. Um, the most recent finds have been Ohio as well as down in North Carolina. You can see right there in that kind of like central northern part of the state, there's those two counties there. Uh, they actually found them in a refrigerated truck yard. Uh, and so uh, just one example, uh, that's, that's the perfect example of, of one of the biggest ways that these things are spread. And that is through hitchhiking, right? Uh, if you looked at one of these maps from back in 2019, you know, 2020, you would actually see uh, a lot of these counties around, you know, uh, a lot of these counties in Pennsylvania, these Southern counties uh, weren't actually had, didn't have infestations, but all these central counties did. And then as you come down this Western border of Virginia, you, these counties have been, in, uh, had infestations for a while. And for those of you who are un unfamiliar with these areas, we have the Pennsylvania Turnpike, which is a major trucking route 
right through the center of the state. There's also a few um, large rail lines that run through there, you know, freight train lines. And then um, down the western, ver uh, western border of Virginia, we have I-81, another huge trucking route. So the perfect example of why we're seeing these things, uh, you know, how, wh what the biggest cause of their spread is right here. Um, that's, you know, tr uh, a lot of these, these satellite populations, these satellite infestations um, are a result of these things hitchhiking to areas where they um, previously haven't been. This is a big deal because these things have the ability to cover a large area in a short amount of time. You can see here, this blue shaded area was 2018, just covered about 5,600 square miles. Then in 2019, that doubled. Uh, and you can see in the green, we're about 13,000 square miles. And then finally in 2020, we have almost tripled, uh, almost quadrupled, excuse me, at 20,000 square miles. Um, so this thing has moved very, very fast. You can kind of see what I was talking about there in that earlier slide where it's following that I-81 corridor and kind of working down the 76, that turnpike there, right? Uh, and so this thing moves very fast and has the ability to spread very, very quickly, right? Um, this is a map that was put out by the USDA. And what they did was they basically looked at the climatic conditions and the environmental conditions that these things thrive in. And they developed this map based on that this is the expected or the potential range that we could see spotted lanternfly spread to here in the future. Something that's very important and, and worth noting is for those of you maybe are, you know, if, if there's any of you West Coasters on, you know what's important here. This is, you have Napa Valley, lots of vineyards there. And once again, this thing can be very impactful to vineyards. We're going to talk about that in a second here as to why, but um, should it uh, really when it gets out to here, we're, we're going to have a big, a big issue. Um, you know, not that we don't have a big issue where it is already, but uh, you can see this thing has the ability to cover quite a large range. Uh, a large portion of the United States uh, is poised to be affected by this. So that's why following those quarantine orders and being vigilant, especially when you're in areas of infestation um, prior to moving your camper or whatever out of that area it's important that we're doing inspections. So what kind of damage does this thing do? Why, you know, all right, we get it. It's gonna move fast. It can move all over the place, but what's it gonna do, right? Well, primarily the issue we're, we're you know, why we're so concerned about these things, you know, I call them a nuisance pest earlier. Uh, I called them a plant stressor earlier, and that's a big deal. We're gonna get into that. But really the, the, the issue here is they feed prolifically. They are heavy, heavy feeders. They show up in these almost plague-like uh, populations. And so, um, you know, things like pick your own orchards, right? Um, they are getting honeydew, which grows sooty mold, and it's getting all over the fruit. It's getting all over the people trying to pick them. Um, we're going to talk about this thing does attract stinging insects. And so it can be a little bit, uh, it does certainly have quite an economic impact as well, uh, especially depending on, you know, what you are doing or, or what kind of um, um, industry you're in. Uh, as far as our immediate industry, primarily that honeydew is the biggest cause of concern for us, right? We're in ornamental uh, horticulture, ornamental arboriculture, right? We are, our, we, our jobs are to make our clients' properties enjoyable and usable. And so, the, you know, the, the fact of the matter is that a lot of times when we have these high populations of spotted lantern fly, it really reduces the usability and the enjoyment that we're gonna get out of using our yards, especially depending on where these things are active. So that's the big deal there, right? Now, that being said, there is still some um, issues as far as plant health goes, right? So um, it is still important that you're understanding what are those important trees um, to your clients, to you, right? That we wanna make sure we're protecting because the fact of the matter is, while this is still a plant stressor, once those plants are stressed, I mean, a perfect example is red maple. Uh, you see these things on red maple all over the place around here, uh, and they will, you know, attack them vigorously. Well, they're weakening these trees, and as these trees are weakened, they're more susceptible to secondary pests like ambrosia beetle attacks, which absolutely will smoke a, a red maple tree uh, and can do it relatively quickly. 
in addition to that, some of our understory plants, right, like our ferns and our little hostas and all these other you know, desirable herbaceous plants, they're going to be getting honeydew dripped all over them. That sooty mold grows and now their photosynthetic capability is reduced sometimes rather significantly. Um, and so for all those reasons, uh, it can still be very important just from a plant health aspect to treat for these things and to manage them, right? Um, like I said, though, the primary impact that we're going to see from these things are lessening the usability and enjoyment of, of our clients' yards, of our own yards, or whatever, right? Um, you know, uh, it, they will cover a, a deck or a patio or the Corvette you have parked underneath your, your maple tree. They'll cover it in this, this honeydew, which will grow sooty mold. It can be a little bit damaging to paint sometimes. Um, you know, especially if you're trying to scrub it off, it can be difficult to remove. Um, and so for all these reasons, you know, especially just the disruption of activities, right? Um, it, it is, it is going to be something that we are running into and we are going to be treating for them, right? Um, this is one thing that people are going to be screaming about. Uh, the cool thing with spotted lanternfly, I think, is that it's one of those pests that has gotten quite a bit of media attention. You've probably seen it on Facebook. Maybe you've seen it on a billboard here and there. Maybe it's been on the news, right? Some of these pictures are actually from ABC News here in Philadelphia. Um, so, you know, it, it's gotten a lot of coverage. And the same can't be said for a lot of our other invasive pests that are rather significant. I never remember seeing emerald ash borer on a billboard ever. Um, and that that one, and that is a big issue, right? But that's another that's another webinar. I don't want to go too far down that one. Um, and so this thing has gotten a quite a bit of attention. And uh, and this is what we're going to be dealing with, right? So uh, one thing that I thought was really cool. So Mike Raup, uh, for those of you familiar with him, he runs a YouTube channel called Bug of the Week. And so this is a uh, part of his, if I can get it to play. Uh, yeah, there we go. Cool. Uh, this is a video of them feeding. And if you look, you can see just how much Look at all that. And so imagine you have thousands and thousands and thousands of these things on a tree feeding that heavily. I have been underneath, uh, I was actually underneath of a, of a weeping willow, a salix, um, about, I don't know, probably five, six years ago. And uh, it was like it was raining on, underneath this tree. I mean, it was gross and fascinating all at the same time. So that just, I wanted to, you know, I like that slide because it really gives you a good example of just how um, how impactful these things can be. This video, I always have trouble getting it to work. I'll give it a, a quick shot here, but this is a, this is a YouTube video of um, uh, that's been around for a while, but you can just see how big of uh, populations you can get that show up on these things, right? So this is just straight off of YouTube. You, there's an awful lot of them on their tree, and this is not, uh, necessarily an exaggerated example uh, either. You will certainly see them show up in, in these, these enormous numbers and just cover the trunks of the trees. So uh, those are two great videos. I'm really glad that second one worked because uh, that's a hit or miss sometimes. Um, but uh, really, really, really cool, really gets the point across there. Um, and I'm sorry if I skewed you out a little bit there, but that's the reality. That's, that's the reality we're dealing with with these things, right? So um, once again, the you know, one last thing is we talk about the last sort of impact that they have. Uh, this can be an impact on our clients, and this can also be an impact on our applicators as we go out and treat for this thing, is that this honeydew absolutely will attract uh, stinging insects. So wasps, hornets, um, bees even, um, ants. Uh, things that'll bite you, whatever. So it's important to keep that in mind if we are going to be going out to treat, uh, especially if we're maybe allergic or sensitive to stinging insects, uh, we want to make sure we are uh, we are aware of some of the hazards that this thing does present to uh, our own health and to our clients' health as well. So that's our impacts, right? Um, rather impactful, I think. Uh, so let's start talking about what their hosts are, right? Um, you know, if you've heard anything about spotted lanternfly, you've probably in the same breath heard something about the Atlantis tree or the tree of heaven. Uh, there is a very good reason for that. Uh, and that is because it's one of the main hosts. But the one thing from this slide that I want you to take, take away is the difference between their host plants as nymphs and their host plants as adults. Right. So there's very little overlap between these two lists. And please keep in mind that these lists are not gospel. Right. 
Um, there could be additions and subtractions from these lists, depending on the area that these things begin to move into. Um, a great example of that is um, really, really early on, we had pine down listed here uh, as a possible host. And since then, at least in the current infestation areas, we have realized that that is not really a host at all for them. They don't really bother with the pines much at all. But these ones listed in bold here, we certainly will see uh, them all over them. Uh, they will absolutely cover a lot of these hosts, uh, these host plants in the uh, infested areas. So something to keep in mind, that's important. Really, really quickly, uh, because Olympus is such a major and important host for this thing, um, it is important to be able to identify it correctly. So uh, for those of you who maybe are unfamiliar with it or you've heard about it, but you're not really sure what it looks like, this is what Tree of Heaven is. Guess what? It's a weed. It is an invasive tree. It grows like crazy. Really, basically, the, uh, the crappier the area, the better this tree is going to grow. And it will grow fast. It colonizes. So you can have, you have if you have one, you generally have 10. Um, and so um, it, you know, it grows very fast. It's weak wooded. It's definitely not uh, normally going to be like a specimen tree. It's not going to be, you know, something that Mrs. Jones has in the middle of her front yard. Um, you know, it, it's, it's not a, really a desirable tree. Um, Early, early on, we had, we, it was kind of hoped or thought that um, this tree of heaven was required to complete the life cycle of spotted lanternfly, but that is certainly not the case anymore. Uh, it can complete its life cycle without ever feeding on uh, an Atlantis tree at all. Um, so not as important as we may have originally thought, but still a key host. Um, Really, as far as identification, the biggest thing that I've ever seen, I've seen this confused with, is staghorn sumac. Very similar, uh, you know, pinnate leaf compound leaves, uh, very similar structure. That staghorn sumac is usually going to be much smaller, though, whereas these Atlantis can grow to be 60, 70 feet sometimes. Uh, so you have a much larger actual tree there. So um, just be, in, be sure to, to know your differences there, right? Uh, now, well, let's get into the life stages, right? This is this is always a good one. Uh, this is important, right? So depending on your area, right now, uh, we can use kind of months uh, because it's in a rather compact area. And um, when we use months, we're, we're really, really still pretty accurate, right? Um, but you can see the difference in how these things look from with how, you know, from their first instar stage right after hatching all the way up until their adult stage. So on the left here, we have our adult right here on the top this is what we're used to seeing. We see it on the billboards, on the, you know, on the news and all that. And then as we kind of go down the line here, this is our fourth. This is our third through first instars. These first and second instars are actually really, really tiny. Even the third ones are pretty small. And due to that coloration, they're going to be all black with white spots. They can be really difficult to spot. They are very, very fast as well. And you can literally chase them around the trunk. So if you're on one side of the trunk, they'll be on the opposite side and you can almost like chase them around. So they're good at hiding, um, you know, they're in their quirky little creatures, uh, <laughs> quite frankly. And so um, really once they get into this fourth, this fourth in star stage, I call this the Darth Maul stage, right? So if you're a fan of Star Wars, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, but this is the stage of them that is really easy to see. Uh, that reddish coloration really stands out. They're much larger than they were when they first hatched. And really as adults, um, you don't normally see this reddish coloration on, the, on that, that second pair, these second uh, pairs of wings there, because these, these wings are, are, they're always folded. Uh, they're usually folded unless they're flying or dead. Um, and so this is what you would normally see on an adult, which does blend in pretty well. So this fourth in star stage, when you're, as far as scouting goes, that was when I really liked to go out and scout because they were the easiest to find, in my opinion. Um, the last picture here, this bottom right picture, is our egg stage. So as you can see, uh, this egg stage is actually quite similar to some of our other pests that we deal with, right? Um, it, it, we're, I think we're going to see a picture here shortly of the spongy moth eggs versus our spotted lanternfly eggs. Very similar in shape, uh, rather similar in, in kind of like what it looks like. Uh, it's slightly different colors and different characteristics, which we'll talk about in a bit here, right? Um, and so the other big difference as far as identification goes, um, it doesn't matter. We're really going to kill them all. Um, however, the male is much smaller than the female. 
Uh, this female just so happens to be pregnant, so it's really exaggerated. But that female will have a yellowish coloration on the ab on the side of the abdomen, as well as will be slightly larger in size than our males. So something interesting there. As we get into our life cycle, as we get into the timing of these things, right? Um, our egg laying stage, which is where we'll start, is going to be kind of like mid late September, depending on your area, through December. Um, it really the first or second hard frost is going to kill any remaining adults off. And then these things will overwinter in their egg stage. So all winter during the dormant season, we're going to see them as, as egg stage only. You're not going to see adults or instars moving around. It will only be that egg stage. So they'll be in that egg stage from October through, uh, this says June. I would actually argue it's probably May. Uh, but once again, Take these time frames with a grain of salt and understand that um, different areas are going to have slightly different timings as far as when we'll see them. Um, if you're familiar with growing degree days and you track your growing degree days, especially for those of us who are not on that West Coast where they're rather irrelevant, uh, but for everybody else in the Midwest, Southeast, Northeast, we can use these growing degree days to kind of track their emergence a little more accurately than trying to use date ranges for everything, right? So uh, you can see these first instars are active really, really early, uh, as early as 240 growing degree days, which is usually happens rather early in the season. I think right now uh, in my area, we've had a rather fluky winter, but I think we're already up to like 44 growing degree days or something crazy like that. So um, they do certainly emerge rather early in the season. We're going to see those first through third instars through about mid-June, sometimes in the July, depending on the climate, where we'll start to see that red coloration developing in those fourth instars, which we'll see usually in the July time frame, right? So that 1300 to about 2200 growing degree day range. Um, fourth instars, they tend to be rather quick. Um, usually, uh, at that time of the year, you know, July, it's it's really warm. And so they're moving and grooving right through these life stages. And so they'll go from fourth instar to adult relatively quickly. And so um, usually you will see, it's not uncommon to see both fourth instar and adults at the same time. Um, they will be adults through, once again, mid, late July, depending on where you are, through that first hard frost. The primary time that they're gonna be feeding uh, the time that they're going to be feeding the heaviest is certainly in that early portion, that early half to three quarters of their adult stage. So through from July through usually early to mid-September is when you're really going to see them feeding very, very heavily. Uh, as it gets later in the season, they're going to stop feeding as heavily. They're going to be more focused on mating, laying eggs. So you'll see them, they'll start kind of moving around a little bit more if we had used maybe a systemic treatment. Um, you know, it, it, you might get, um, you know, questions about its, its efficacy. And really, it's just simply they're not feeding as heavily. So some of our systemic treatments may not be working as well as they had been in the past. So it's something to keep in mind there. We'll talk about that a little bit more later on. Um, as far as, um, once again, just this really quickly, uh, this is another time. Uh, and this What this slide is focused on is the um, you know, when they're feeding on what, right? So we had talked about, we had looked at that host slide a little bit earlier on, and we saw that uh, that first through third instar, in that instar stage, they were feeding on, you know, primarily herbaceous plants. We saw roses on there, for example. And then as adults in that fourth instar through adult stage, they're moving on to our woody plants. So that's our maples, our willows, our walnuts, our Atlantis trees, um, you know, all those hosts, uh, river birches, you name it. Uh, Japanese snowbells, I've seen them on, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot, but that's when they're moving on to those woody stemmed plants, right? Uh, and so this is a great uh, slide for that. Um, really quickly, quick side note here. If you're interested in, um, if, if you wanted to, you know, save this somewhere, or you were interested in taking a closer look at any of these, uh, these charts that I'm showing, uh, you can go on our website, and download our spotted lanternfly guide. And all of this is in our spotted lanternfly guide. So I would encourage you, um, please feel free to jump on um, our website. Go ahead and download that. You know, share it with your clients, share it with your coworkers. Uh, it's got a lot of really great information in it. We're, we're uh, very proud of that guide. And so I, uh, I would encourage you to go download that and read through it. So 
Um, egg laying stage. Now, this is an important stage, right? Because as I talked about earlier, hitchhiking is one of the big ways that these things are spread. And so um, the big culprit here is the egg stage as far as hitchhiking goes. Now, before I get too much into that, I want to draw your attention to the bottom left photo here, right? Uh, if you can see my little laser pointer. Um, on the left side, we have, uh, it's, this, is a, this is our spot of lanternfly egg mass. So, right, you can see it's kind of, uh, you know, a darkish gray color um, versus the more tan. This is our spongy, uh, if you're unfamiliar with spongy moth, it used to be called the gypsy moth. This is our spongy moth egg mass. It's going to have kind of, it's going to be, you know, fuzzy almost uh, or spongy. <laughs> That's probably why they named it the spongy moth, actually. Um, but regardless, uh, you can see you can see the differences here. So um, these two uh, pests were nice enough to uh, lay their egg masses right next to each other. So we have a wonderful here example of the differences between these two egg masses. Now, if you look at this picture on the right, you can see that this is once this is also a spotlight fly egg mass. But you can see this coating looks a lot different than it does over here. And the main reason for that is when this coating is fresh, when they are first, when they first put this coating over their egg mass, right? You can see their eggs are in a nice line here, then they'll cover it with this coating. It's a, it's a lot lighter in color. And as the winter progresses, as the season moves on and they get older, they darken in color and they could be a lot trickier to see. So if you're out there and you're, you're looking to, and you're scouting, the best time to scout for your egg masses is gonna be early in the winter, early in that season, right after they're done laying them. They're going to be much easier to see than they are later in the season, about this time of year. They're very dark in color and they blend in very, very well to a lot of tree bark. Now, that's the other thing. They're not just going to lay these eggs on trees, especially not just their hosts. I've seen them lay eggs on just about anything. Uh, you can see in this top picture, it looks like we're looking at the... Uh, I don't know, the deck of a railing or, you know, railing or something maybe. Um, but to drive this point home, uh, here's a bunch of other photos of them just on all kinds of stuff. I mean, a light bulb for uh, crying out loud. Like, what in the world? Like, uh, I don't think that's where I would choose if I, uh, if I laid eggs to, to lay them. I don't think that's where I'd be looking. But nonetheless, um, they lay, they'll, lay, they'll lay eggs on just about anything. You can see why they're so easy to spread through hitchhiking. They will lay these eggs on the frames of trailers or campers, right? Um, you can see they're laying them right on the sidewall of a tire there. Um, they blend in really, really well to that metal fence post there in the middle. Um, burn barrels, uh, camping equipment there in the bottom left. You can see there's one of, some, one of those little foldable chairs, right? I've seen them on uh, the, the uh, you know, siding uh, seems to be a big one that they like to, to lay eggs on, right? And so they will lay eggs basically wherever they want. Uh, <laughs> um, and so... Um, that's uh, really an important thing. You know, don't just be looking at their host plants when you're scouting. Look everywhere. Look at the fence posts. Look at the vehicles, right? Especially if they have, maybe they have a camper that's sitting there that is parked for the most of the year, right? Or they, they've just brought it back from the beach and it's been sitting there. It was sitting there all September and October. Check that because there's a good chance if you have spotted lanternfly present that there's an egg mass on there somewhere, right? So pay attention to that. That's really, really key. Um, these things will lay up to three egg masses, and these egg masses will contain anywhere between 30 and 50 eggs. And so one female can be responsible for up to 150 new uh, spotted lanternflies. So you can see why these satellite populations are so easily established and you get infestation levels very quickly, um, even when it is maybe just one or two egg masses that were um, transported out of uh, a quarantine zone or out of an infested county, infested county, excuse me. All right. So um, we've talked about the quarantines a little bit here. Um, you know, a lot of us are familiar with quarantines for other pests, right? We've, we've you know, we've dealt with quarantines before. Um, the biggest thing here is not moving firewood. That seems to be a really, really big one. That seems to be a big culprit for moving a lot of our uh, invasive pests around, right, is the firewood. So don't move the firewood around. Uh, you know, don't sell your firewood to somebody four counties over, especially if they're not in a quarantine zone or they don't have uh, a, a detected, uh, you know, they haven't detected spider lanterfly fly in that county. Just be, you know, be vigilant of that. Just pay attention. Use some common sense. Uh, another big thing is 
if you uh, you know if you're going to be going camping, if you notice that your clients have campers and things, um, you know, educating them on why this is so important that they check before they leave and drive that thing out to wherever they're going. Um, you know, and it's easy to say that I understand, uh, you know, most of the time you say that you sound like it's like you're kind of wasting your breath. But one thing I found that really hits home is uh, if you let them know that, you know, this thing has the potential to raise wine prices that hits home, ladies and gentlemen, that's how you do it. Um, if there's one thing that uh, Americans really value and don't want to see their uh, prices raised on, I would argue that one of those things is certainly uh, wine price. Uh, I could be wrong on that. That's probably not across the board. But um, <laughs> if there's anything you can say, that usually seems to be the thing that hits home and they go, oh, all right, I'm going to I'm going to check a little bit better because I don't want my uh, Moscato to go up in price too much. Right. Uh, and so Pennsylvania does have a, a little bit of a unique order. Uh, each state is going to have their own little nuances. So um, be sure that you're um, reading and understanding the different quarantine zones based on the area that you're in. So let's get into management. Let's talk about some research here. So um, something that's very important here at Rainbow is that everything that we say is backed by science. Everything that we recommend, all of our protocols are backed in science. And so before we get into the actual management, I'd like to take a little bit of time and go through some of the research that we've done and some of our cooperators have done with us on um, the, the different techniques on controlling this. So the first thing we're looking at here, uh, this is from Dr. Bittinger and Heather Leach from Penn State. Um, this is looking at a foliar spray. So we're looking at bifenthrin here primarily. Uh, you can see that there's a whole lot of other actives, but we're gonna talk about bifenthrin uh, primarily and you'll see why in the next slide. But you can see these things are really easy to kill, right? Uh, this is a percent, percent mortality. We're getting just about 100% mortality, whether we're spraying bifenthrin or carbaryl or, or even acephate. Um, you can see we're getting great control almost across the board. Now, as we get into the spinosad and the spire tetramat, uh, our, our results dwindle a little bit. We're not getting quite near the control that we want. But I want you to look at this. This is the slide that hits home. So um, you know, it's like, well, we could have picked any number of those on the first slide, but this slide shows us our residual. So this is showing us our seven and 14 days after application, right? And when you look at that, you can see that bifenthrin comes out as the clear winner. Uh, at seven days after application, we're still getting 100%. And at 14 days, two weeks after application, we're still getting almost 80% control, 80% uh, mortality. Um, of these spider lanternfly nymphs on, on this, this, this treated um, peach tree. And so that's why when it comes to foliar sprays, you're going to hear most folks recommend that we use a bifenthrin product, uh, one of those bifenthrin products. And most of that is due to its longer residual activity. Um, okay, so that's our, um, that's our foliar sprays. Now, uh, we're going to get into systemic treatments, and this is where most folks, uh, this is what most uh, recommendations are going to are going to have on there, is um, systemic treatments. Uh, and so, dinatefron uh, across the board has been the clear winner when it comes to um, treating these things systemically, whether it's with a lower bark spray or an infusible, uh, an injectable option, which is where you know you could put it through a, a, a root flare injector, a stem injector, right? Uh, and so you can see here that with both the Transtech Bark and the Transtech Infusible, these are two uh, Dynatefiron products, we've gotten great control of the adults. The Transtech Infusible certainly works a little bit faster, um, and, uh, and but, but, but both uh, great, great results there, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. So uh, these are some pictures from the trial. On the left, you can see adults feeding. Uh, and there's that kind of that yeast and mold growing on the ground at the base of, uh, of the, with the, our control tree there. Uh, versus on the right, there's a picture and, and then we laid these tarps out underneath the uh, trees. Uh, and this is actually just four hours after treatment too with our infusible, uh, which is our root flare injected uh, option. And so you can see just four hours, we've already got a, a pretty big number on there. Uh, if you're on your phone, you're probably a hard time seeing them, but uh, they're there. There's quite a bit there too. So that's how we got these this this data. Um, this is a trial we did with um, Dr. Eric Day from Virginia Tech. 
Um, and so we've had a lot of people that ask about using imidacloprid. And so uh, based on work that's been done, imidacloprid has been found to work, but it's rather in, inconsistent when it comes to our efficacy results, right? Uh, in 2020, we conducted this trial uh, comparing imidacloprid using the highest labeled rate for soil application, as well as the highest rate for tree injection uh, versus our standard rate of transect as just the bark spray. Uh, and I think we, oh yeah, we also did transect infusible there as well at a, at a lower rate too. Um, so you can see that transect and transect infusible pretty much working immediately uh, and over the entire length of the trial, uh, they were very highly effective, right? Imidacloprid treatments didn't really start working until about 10 weeks after treatment and were rather kind of inferior to those transtech treatments. Uh, and so the expected time to work in the lower efficacy rates uh, are kind of the reasons that uh, imidacloprid is usually, you know, you'll see that listed as inconsistent. Um, and so um, the one other thing too is, is, is I've, and I've heard this a couple of times too, is, well, why don't we just use imidacloprid earlier in the season? Uh, and the big drawback to that is that earlier in the season, we usually have a lot of blooming and flowering plants. And so we actually can't use imidacloprid, being that it is a neonic and we would be off label if we're applying it to plants that are in flower. So uh, for that reason, that's why you'll hear Dinotefron over and over again as kind of that industry standard treatment, right? Um, one more uh, one more trial to go and then we'll jump into our, uh, you know, we'll jump into the management here. I would like to leave some time for questions at the end. Um, and so I'm going to try my best to do that. Um, and so uh, last last trial here, uh, this one was done by Dr. Steffel from Lab Services out here in Pennsylvania. Uh, and you can see so many of the, the state treatment programs, they want to start applications as early as possible, right? So in, back in 2020, we did this trial to see if early spring treatments with our 12 packet rate or high rate of transtech uh, would last the entire year. So we treated these trees in May and then beginning in August, we put mesh cages um, placed around the trunks of these trees with lantern flies inside of them, right? We left them for seven days and then we recorded the amount of lantern fly that were killed. Uh, the results here, you can see both transtech bark spray and infusible still provide a great control we're recommending them. We're usually seeing about five months of control. Um, and what's interesting here too is that there is actually rather high mortality in our untreated control as well. And the reason for that is that these things were um, essentially Korea, uh, you know, um, kind of like killing themselves by wedging themselves in between the uh, the mesh cage and the trunk. And so uh, that did skew our untreated control results a little bit. Um, but regardless, uh, we got the data that we were looking for, and that was that we are still seeing results and, and effectiveness five months after treatment. And so for that reason, uh, our recommendation, if you're going to do a transtech bark spray, would be to treat in July, um, which will cover you through the remainder of their life cycle. So it's nice because in July, we do kind of hit a little bit of a lull. You know, our, our fungicide treatments are wrapping up. Well, our fungicide treatments should be pr practically done, depending on where we are. Uh, um, and so, you know, it, July seems to be a, a pretty good time and, and it works out great for, for folks to get these treatments out. And then we don't have to worry about them anymore, right? That's always a wonderful thing. So let's talk about management. Um, you know, we've, we've looked at the biology, we've looked at some research, and now let's tie it all together. Um, so what we're going to talk about briefly is tree removal. Uh, that's a lot of state programs have been or are doing that currently. Egg scraping, tree banding, foliar sprays, and then our systemic treatments, which is those transtech treatments we just talked about, right? So with tree removal, um, most of this is focused on Alanthus trees. Like I said, they're an invasive, uh, they're an invasive tree. They're, they're not really a desirable tree. Most folks, if they have them, it's just because they've kind of let them go. Uh, these things primarily are growing along railroad tracks, highways, and like abandoned areas. That's where you're going to find your Atlantis trees primarily. So we can remove these things. It's an important, too, when we remove them that we are treating them with some sort of woody herbicide. Uh, you know, uh, so triclopyr seems to be the biggest one, uh, sightline, uh, garlon. Uh, those are the ones that most people are using. Uh, basically, you can do a cut stump treatment or 
the old hack and squirt method where they're taking a cutting implement and hacking little notches and applying the herbicide right to those little notches that they're creating. Uh, but regardless, if you don't treat uh, Atlantis trees, they will sprout right back. And what you'll wind up with is instead of that one that you cut down, you'll wind up with 15 of them sprouting all over the place. And so you, you wind up with a bigger mess. So if you're gonna take the Atlantis trees down, be sure that you're treating them um, uh, accordingly so that they don't just re-sprout. Um, that's important. Now, um, egg scraping, this is a big one. This is the one you see. Uh, there's also this, this stomp and smash method. Um, that's pretty self-explanatory. I don't think we have to go through that now. Uh, but egg scraping is the kind of the next one that you see that's 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 promoted to the general public, and it certainly works, right? Um, you know, re remove those egg masses. Use a, you know, a, you know, whatever. I'd say, say a credit card. I don't know if you want to use your credit card for it, but some kind of card similar to that. Um, and then uh, you put those egg masses into a bag filled with alcohol or hand sanitizer, and you can dispose of them that way. Now, is this a management technique we're going to use commercially? Absolutely not because um, they will not just, you know, their eggs are all throughout the entire crown. They're not just on that lower reachable portion. And if you try and tell a climber to, to, to go up the tree and scrape all the egg masses off, well, they're not gonna work for you very long because that is gonna be a miserable and uh, really, or it's not gonna be a fun job. Um, and so uh, egg scraping, it's it's cool if you're with a client uh, and you happen, you know, you're showing them the egg masses and you're saying, Hey, you can go ahead and scrape it off if you if you can do it and dispose of it properly. But uh, in, in in you know realistically, this is not a control method. Um, it's not practical, and it's really not going to be very effective either, right? And so that's egg scraping. The next thing we see all over the place are these sticky bands, and these sticky bands are great. Um, but understand once again that these things are not going to be probably what we would employ as a commercial management technique. They are great for scouting. Um, so if you're in an area where maybe you're, you're not sure if you have them or not, or you just wanna kind of get an idea of the population that you'll be dealing with, they're great for scouting for nymphs. But what inevitably winds up happening is that they will fill up, especially if you are in an area of high population, and then they become uh, practically useless, right? The other issue is that you can get um, unintended consequences. Um, you, you know, you can get birds and squirrels and small children stuck to these things, and uh, nobody wants that. And so if you are going to use these things, keep that in mind. Use some sort of uh, barrier around it to keep that from accidentally happening. <laughs> uh, you can also get um, beneficials trapped in there as well. So. Um, I think they're great for scouting, and I think they do have, uh, you know, uh, uh, they do have their their spot as far as management, but uh, it is limited. And for most of us in a commercial setting, uh, it's not what we would be doing in most cases. It's great if homeowners are looking for something that they can do all day long. Um, you know, it's there's certainly nothing wrong with it, um, but uh, not necessarily what we would be doing. So. Let's get into what we can do as you know, commercial applicators um, doing this on a larger scale across multiple properties. Um, there's foliar sprays, right? So we can use our bifenthrin products, bifen XTS and Upstar Gold are just two of them that we had that, that are available. There's about a million of them out there. Um, but once again, make sure you're reading the labels, get your rates. You will get contact kill for up to four weeks, right? We, we uh, usually not quite four weeks, but uh, with that data we looked at earlier on, you can see uh, definitely up to 14 days. We are getting really, really great control and management, right? Um, you can also use this if you have really sensitive clients. You can target shrubs uh, early in the season to control nymphs, and uh, later in the season you will get nice, quick knockdown of adults. Um, if it's a client that maybe waited too late and called you like late in September and really wanted to get something done, uh, this is a fantastic option for that. Obviously, for those of us who are, uh, have ever done any kind of spraying, we understand that there are a lot of concerns when it comes to that. Um, with bifenthrin, it's a non-selective, so we are going to be killing anything that comes into contact with our application, and that includes beneficials. Um, also, there's the obvious public perception and the environmental concerns, drift concerns, all of that kind of stuff that comes along with our foliar sprays. Not saying that they're wrong, 
Uh, and, and they are a valuable tool in our toolbox when it comes to management. But keep in mind that we do obviously have those, those uh, uh, concerns, uh, considerations when it comes to that kind of stuff, right? So that brings us to our last, our systemic treatments. Um, Transect and Transect Infusible, those are Rainbow's versions of, of uh, the two, the two uh, Dinotefron products that we carry, both of which work fantastically. We get really, really fast control. And quite frankly, they are the best choice when it comes to treatments um, on trees, especially ornamental trees and shrubs. Um, and we get that nice five month long residual, right? So Transtech WSP, it comes in water soluble packets. So it's like one of the easiest things you can almost do out there as an applicator. You can count to 12, you can treat for a spotted lanternfly. Um, and so basically what you're gonna get is you have these little packets, they're water soluble. You count 12 of them out, you drop them in a gallon of water uh, and you shake it up and you can use a backpack spray or, or, uh, or a hand sprayer, whichever you prefer. Um, and what you're gonna be doing is spraying the bottom four to five feet of that trunk. Essentially what we're looking for is getting about an ounce and a half to two ounces of that mixed solution per inch of tree diameter. Um, just to give you an idea of the amount of product that we're putting out there. So it's a very low volume application. Our, our concerns with drift, even public perception uh, go significantly down, especially uh, even applicator exposure goes way down uh, because once again, as long as we're wearing our PPE, we're doing a nice low volume, lower pressure. Um, and so there's less of that potential for drift getting all over us as applicators, which is always a bummer. And so it's it's not, excuse me, it's nice that we have these lower volume treatments. Um, we also do have 24 C labels, um, specifically for spider lanternfly in most states where we have infestations present. So um, that also what that enables us to do is to use those higher rates um, to control spotted lanternfly, right? So uh, those 24 C, C labels, um, it's important just to make sure that you review them and you have them with you, but they do enable you to do um, uh, that higher rate when it comes to controlling spotted lanternfly. So that's very nice. Then we have our Transect Infusible. And Transect Infusible is our, um, is, it's our trunk injectable option. Uh, so it's just like our Transect WSP, except that it is in liquid form, and we're going to inject this right into the trunk, right? Um, and this is great if we're doing spiral lanternfly treatments, maybe in public parks, near waterways, um, you know, where, where folks are a little more sensitive. When we apply it through um, trunk injection, it's, it's a closed system, so there is usually, well, there should be almost no exposure to the environment or to, you know, just uh, the folks walking by because it's going directly into the tree. Um, there's no spraying at all. So it's a wonderful option for those public areas for around waterways and things like that. Uh, you can see it's low volume. We get nice fast uptake with it. It's a high uh, concentration of, of product. So we're injecting one and a half to two mils um, you know, per inch, which is just relatively nothing. And once again, it's all contained within the tree. So our impact to non-target organisms, including the applicator and the general public is low to non-existent. Um, there are a few considerations when it comes to this, right? We're drilling into the tree. So we are physically damaging that tree and tree injection will absolutely take just a little bit longer than our trunk spray, which you can be in and out of there in like 30 seconds with the trunk spray sometimes, uh, whereas trunk injection will take a little bit longer. So some things to consider there when it comes to this. Um, keep an eye on the time here because unfortunately we do have a hard stop at the top of the hour. Uh, but once again, all of this information, you can find it in our Spotted Lanternfly Management Guide that is available on our website. Please, 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 um, I'd love it. If you, if you want more information, go download it. Uh, it's great information in there. Um, and so to kind of wrap all this up, uh, the last few slides we have here are kind of, uh, you know, when do we treat, why do we treat, and, and like how do we determine when we're going to do all this stuff, right? And a lot of this, most of this is dictated by our clients' tolerances, right? There's going to be clients out there that are like, I don't want to see one stinking spot of lanternfly on my property. There's other going to be clients that are like, I don't care. It doesn't really bother me much. 
If you can control them near the patio where I'm sitting at reading, that will be fantastic. But for the most part, if they're on my property, I'm okay with that. I just want to, you know, or maybe I want to protect this tree, right? So speaking to the client, understanding and figuring out what their tolerances are, right? Do they have a high tolerance? They're not really affected by the presence of those insects, or do they have a really low tolerance? Or are they somewhere maybe in the middle? Most folks are going to fall in that middle tolerance area. So once you have that figured out, then you're able to go and you're going to kind of develop a strategy and you can put a proposal together for what you're going to do for them on that property, right? Um, some other things to consider when it comes to treatment is what time of the year is it? If it's late September, we're not going to do a systemic treatment of Transtech because, you know, we're not going to get the residual we need. Like I said, these things aren't feeding as heavily. So that's a time where if there is any treatment, um, you know, recommended, it's going to be probably a bifenthrin treatment, right? Because we're so late in that season. The other thing to consider is plant material or site restrictions. Is there a creek in the backyard? Uh, is there a play set where there's children? Does the neighbor have a dog that'll never go inside because, you know, they're, they're, they're not home all day and the dog just hangs out in the backyard, right? All these things are things we run into all the time. Those are also going to kind of dictate which method we use to control and how we control and where we control, right? And then obviously the client expectations, that might be the biggest one we deal with, right? What do they want? What are their goals for their yard? Uh, and so once again, that's really important, prioritizing all of that stuff based on our clients and the area in which we're treating. So really quickly here to look just uh, briefly at our, you know, this is a residential. Uh, you can see these are some of the areas that I would target uh, if it's a, it's a low or mid tolerance. Um, you know, around the pool, around the front, the front, uh, the front walkway there. Uh, maybe this is where they, they parked their car in the, in, the, in the driveway here, right? Uh, whatever, or this is the patio, whatever that is, right? If they have really low tolerances, then I'm going to come out back here and I'm probably going to start doing, you know, removing the Atlantis trees. Maybe I'll spot spray with bifenthrin back here. Uh, you know, they're not back here often, but if they have low tolerance, we're going to want to control it back here as well, right? And then we're going to look at a commercial property really quickly, right? Commercial properties, we're going to be focusing, we're going to have a completely different focus, right? We're going to be focused on the high traffic areas, right? So maybe these are all red maple um, parking lot trees. Uh, you know, we don't, they, you know, most commercial properties, they, they want you to come and, and, and park and, and hang out in their stores for a long time. And so, if they, they're gonna to wanna to stop that honeydew from dripping all over your vehicle because then you're not gonna be as likely to shop there maybe, right? So we're gonna be looking at those high traffic areas. That's gonna be our concern. Uh, if there's a really low, uh, if there's a higher concern then we can get into these areas, but generally on commercial properties, we're more worried about the high traffic areas. So with that, 